thank you for making time for the show that focuses on African growth and development. This week, we talk AMISOM, the African Union mission in Somalia. We get your views on the issues and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. This week on the Africa Leadership Dialogues, we focus on the all-important issue of stability in Somalia. We look at AMISOM, the African Union mission in Somalia, and our guest is Dr. Maman Sidi Kou. He is the special representative of the chairperson of the African Union Commission for Somalia, and he's the head of the African Union mission in Somalia. AMISOM is an active regional peacekeeping mission operated by the African Union with the approval of the United Nations. AMISOM is mandated to provide support to the federal institutions in Somalia in their efforts towards stabilization of the situation in the country and the furtherance of dialogue and reconciliation. It's also mandated to facilitate the provision of humanitarian assistance and create conducive conditions for long-term stabilization, reconstruction and development in Somalia. Let's get straight to his views on stability, peace and development in Somalia. Thank you very much for making time for the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Um, your task is not an easy one by any means. And in many ways, some people would describe AMISOM as an attempted African solution to what is an African problem. What then is your assessment of how far we have come? How much of Somalia have you been able to take back? And what's the situation on the ground at the moment, please? Well, thank you very much for having me on this show that I watch often. Thank you. Somalia, as it described in international media, is not a Somalia I, I see every day. Starting with Mogadishu, mm -hmm. yes, you may have a bomb going off here and there because that's a tactic that our enemy has chosen now. But I also see a city bustling with life, people sitting at terrace of cafes, cranes all over building, New buildings coming up, buildings funded by diaspora. It gives you an idea of the trust and confidence they have in their country, re, country's renewal. In the cities, towns liberated in country, I also see return. I see people with businesses. We do need to get closer, when I say we, I mean, Amisom, but more importantly, the federal government of Somalia and its demembrement, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, structures mm -hmm. down in the regions, to get closer to people's concerns in terms of providing the basics, mm -hmm. the water, the education for children, the health facilities, etc. And Somalia, we know, cannot do it alone now. Somalia needs the support of partners beyond just what we're doing militarily. I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Iraq, and what I see is a country yearning, people yearning to go back to their past glory. Mm -hmm. Where, when they were hosting the African Union Summit, like it happened in 1974, when they contributed to liberate our brothers and sisters of South Africa, from the grips of apartheid, when they train so many people from other countries. I see that every day I, I talk with Somalis. Deep inside of them, they are sad of a situation they're in. But also, uh, they're very grateful for the sacrifices and the support African brothers and sisters coming to, to, to help them against the scourge of terrorism. And I, when we help them, we're not helping them alone. We're helping ourselves as well. And that's what we call African solution to African problem. But beyond that, it's not only an African problem. It's a global problem. Right. Terrorism has no border. 
the, the, the philosophy, the ideology of hatred al-Shabaab and their kins from elsewhere are spreading is a, really a bad bad. Having people collide, having nations be divided, just like we've done when exploiting clan differences. Well, we're trying it in, in Kenya, and we're not careful. They, want, they will succeed. Let's go to, to um, the structures. I'm going to come to the mindsets yeah, sure. in just a moment, but let's go to the structures on the ground just so our viewers can understand better yeah. uh, the nature of Amisom. Um, 22,000 plus yeah. um, is, is uh, your, 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 your offices, force, yeah. your force on the ground, um, a combination of various African countries um, engaged in various different activities. And look, at the end of the day, you are a force. But my understanding is that it goes beyond that. There's yeah. a lot of infrastructure work. Yeah. There's a lot of social support that has to happen. So help our audience understand yeah. the nature of the work that Amazon is actually doing well, in Somalia. Well, very simply, put, we are 22,126 police, military and police, plus a uh, few civilians compared to the numbers, we are 70 more or less. Mm -hmm. Working, first of all, our mandate says degrade al-Shabaab, destroy them as much as we can, prepare the ground for stabilization in the country, political process, so that they go to election by 2016, mm -hmm. but also supporting the Somali government to put regional institutions in place, uh, plus, of course, help them provide to the people. Right. And not belittling the political process, because Amisom is providing corridors of peace, spaces of peace, so national dialogue, reconciliation parlays take place, so people go beyond their differences. So by the end of the day, when it comes to elections, they're ready to go together. Mind you, a very strong part of our this mandate is assuring, working towards giving voice to minorities and to women in particular. So everything we do has to have a gender dimension to gender mainstreaming everything we do. And also we carry along with Somali security forces to be in a bad mindset. When you go to a typical place where we are, Mogadishu, or you have Ugandans, or you go to uh, uh, down south, uh, IJ, when you have a Kenyan and Ethiopians, or you go to, let's say, what we call Sector 5, where you have a Djiboutians, etc. Uh, what you see is men and women in uniform mm -hmm. uh, working, trying to do exactly what I mentioned earlier, but also trying to secure the supply routes. Because for 25 years, you haven't had a road right. built in Somalia, not even maintained. So you can imagine what it means for us with the booby traps, with, with, with ambushes, and supporting humanitarian groups, escort, escorting them to take food, medicine to different places. That's what you see. Mm -hmm. uh, but people f uh, forget that we are not just sitting in Mogadishu. We have five, four other places where our forces are. We supply by, via helicopters, uh, medicine, uh, we support our troops with water, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So and basic structures basic, that the society requires. Mm -hmm. So this is what we are really at. Uh, so we always have to go back to our mandate and not just look at the 22,000 as just a figure like this. But what are these 22,000 doing daily and sometimes not sleeping because uh, our enemy doesn't sleep? And, and our enemy doesn't also know which sectors we, are, we have. Right which means that we need to support each other across sectors. And Collaboration. Work with, yeah, and work with Somali army while we're training them to fight the enemy. Let's go back to 1993 and, yeah. and what we could call the fall of Somalia. Yeah. And uh, America came in very uh, early um, mm -hmm. and was rejected by the people in many ways. People look at the war against terror and say, at the, you know, the, the foundation of this war is actually a hearts and minds battle. So my next question to you is, are you as Amazon winning the hearts and minds of the Somali people or are there challenges there? There are challenges, but we know that a war like this one cannot be won militarily only. It's not a matter of a gun. Mm. It's a matter also having a buy-in of the communities about a project. That is also a Somali project that we're supporting. Better governance, locally, providing to the people, so that they see there is a difference with Al-Shabaab. 
uh, and ultimately showing that we are there for just one time. But hearts and minds starting from the community level up because the St. Thomases that I keep talking about, the people who want to see to believe, are the first. doubting Thomases. Yes. Saint Thomases. Are the ones that are on ground first. Right. If they believe that's what we are there for, mm -hmm. then Al Shabaab has no hiding place. Right now, while we carrying what we call the Juba Corridor operations, people are coming out denouncing pro Al Shabaab people. They're coming out and giving our troops goats and millets and, and cereals. Okay. Feed yourself, please. Mm. Stay with us. Mm. But continue, please. Don't stop. And we don't intend to stop. But That's the only way. If you don't have a community view, just like police work we, we, we are doing now, it's about community policing before just regular police work. To have the support of the people is, is key, and to have them even resource you um, says a lot okay. about their appreciation. Um, let's talk radicalization and recruitment. What are you doing as a force to ensure that you are cutting off access to more militants for Al-Shabaab? Well, this is uh, something a little bit beyond AMISO. Mm -hmm. This is really have to do with uh, all of us, Africans and international community, getting to the root of the issue. You cannot have so many desperate youth in the streets, in the rural areas, having no job, no prospect, no, or seeing themselves with no future, and not have some of them giving to the propaganda or to the pennies that Al Shabaab would give them. When sometimes we capture Al Shabaab combatants, we really talk about 15, 16, 17 year old children because these are children. Right. So what would take a child like that in this kind of situation? Desperation. Perhaps some for some of them, some are looking for identity. Some of them never have been able to make it to school because that has stopped a long time ago. So this is what we want all of us to understand. I mean, some will do his uh, own fight. I mean, some will also work with local communities to ensure that when, when Al-Shabaab is rooted out from a place, they don't leave behind their choleric teachers and their over mind polluters. This we have to do work with the international community, with the Somalis, of course, but even with the diaspora, mm -hmm. Somalian diaspora, but very well aware of that situation. But ultimately, give people hope, give them some prospect, and you would do away with Al-Shabaab. Mm -hmm. Because now we fight them, they abandon arms, they mesh into the population, and they wait for a better day while continuing the work of all these invaders, all these Ethiopians, all these Kenyans, all these people who want our sea, who want our this and that, who are, who are against our religion, while they are sometimes they're killing Muslim. Mm -hmm. I'm a Muslim praying since I was age four, who are memorized the Quran. Yet for these people, of course, I'm an enemy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the work we all have to embark on together. You mentioned education, and, and uh, it's really important to note that uh, in many of these areas, here in East Africa, in West Africa as well, you notice extremists targeting educational facilities. It's almost the first step. Um, and the, the importance of standing together as a continent to say we will continue to invest in education. Garissa is an example. Um, can we go back into Garissa and set up the university again? Those are questions that we need to ensure we're pushing administrations on. Back to the question of stability in Africa. This may not be your mandate, but as an African, I'm going to pose this question to you. You focus on Somalia, but right here in East Africa, there's a growing concern about Burundi. Of? Burundi. Burundi. Yes. And what could be a looming crisis yeah. in Burundi. There are warnings coming out of Burundi that we could see violence there. Um, are you seeing any effort to strategically address Burundi and ensure that we go in ahead of any crisis, not to try to mop up or, or resolve a problem? Well, you asked me to talk as an African, yes. and I usually don't shy away from, from giving my views. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the efforts at the African Union end to reflect and find solutions to the Burundi case in particular. But beyond Burundi, it has to be has to do with governance issue all over, all over this continent, mm -hmm. or failure of leadership all over, all over Africa. But we have to tackle front on or head on 
unless we want our youth to just revolt and say enough is enough. Not addressing directly the Burundi case because others are, are looking into it. So others and the message is that it is being looked into. Yeah, well, that's a message mm -hmm. being looked into. And I really hope that we'll find a solution quick because otherwise it also impact on me as head of Amisom. I have Burundi troops there. Right. I have about 5,000 of them. I don't want those troops to be divided right. along whatever lines. I don't want them to be demoralized. I don't want them to forget that the common enemy is out there, but is one to spread all over. And I want to be in fighting mood and ready to do the job. So I would appeal also on our Burundi brothers who are back home to carefully measure up what the stakes are. Uh, but as I told you, uh, to me, all this has to do with uh, leadership failures all over Africa. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. We, we started the journey into independence with a dream and a vision to stand together and ensure every African state was liberated. We had a dream for unity. Um, we had ambitions and aspirations as Africans. You've just referred to leadership failure. What went wrong? Well, I mean, uh, we all remember Kunkurma, Kwame Nkurma, mm -hmm. Africa must unite. Mm -hmm. That's some guy somewhere, uh, one of my famous favorite artists <laughs> called Africa Unite, that beautiful song by Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from a generation who grew up with those things. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, it's tough. What went wrong, I believe, is uh, certainly there is external interference in different countries and things that happen. But you cannot always talk about inter external interference uh, and made that an excuse. Right. We may need a new generation of leaders who truly, truly look beyond the power of a day, mm -hmm. how they can stick to power and, and also uh, benefit from it. Are we nurturing them? Uh, well, mm. that's a question. We should, we must. Mm. It's certainly happening. I see a vibrant civil society in Africa. That is, to me, is a hope. Mm -hmm. I see uh, women groups that no longer are silent. But, but, but that's a hope. Mm -hmm. And that linkage with new leaders, and some existing as well, would come together. I'll bring you back to your mandate. Thank you for sharing your views. And, and possibly Amisom is a sign that things are indeed changing. Let's just look at the, the border situation and the concerns on the borders. And uh, particularly the a big discussion in Kenya that has been ongoing about the poorest borders and what we should do yeah, about them. Yeah. What would your message be to, to, to leaders in Kenya, Ethiopia, any other neighboring states that, that are, have serious concerns about the borders? Come closer together, gentlemen. Think together, plan together, fight together. Uh, what we're dealing with is if does not give room to internal politics. When you send boys and girls to die far away from the children, well, duty is to be together. Right. Duty is to make sure that they feel we are with them. Otherwise, what kind of signal are we sending? So internal differences or, uh, or our own little, little agendas have no place there. Right. As head of AMISOM, I sign every week what we call noticas, which means X has died, X has lost his limb, etc. Mm -hmm. That's the most painful, most difficult work I do. You personally sign each of them? I personally sign them. So that these documents go to African Union Peace and Security Council, Peace and Security Department, to make sure these people are compensated and compensated on time. This we have to work on and be closer to our boys and, 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 and girls. So come together, share intelligence. Don't just have intelligence for yourself. Share it across the region. Share it with all true contributing countries so we're better prepared to, to face the enemy because they, they do that. 
They have their allies in the world, but provide them to them. So that's, that's, that's the message. message. Let's come to corruption and, and questions of integrity. And the difficulty anybody faces fighting terrorism is that you must maintain the moral high ground in order not to go down to the level sure. of the terrorists sure. themselves. And questions have been raised over, for instance, the charcoal trade. Many people refer to that. Mm -hmm. and, and military involvement, mm -hmm. KDF particularly, has mm -hmm. been cited. Um, in, in terms of America, part of the rejection of the force that went there um, in the 90s and part of the rejection of the other forces that were there was a feeling of, of inhumane treatment of the locals. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you do in terms of commenting on the corruption situation and how you uphold and maintain the human rights of Somalians on the ground. Please well, share. Uh, very quickly, two things concerning mm. Amisom more, more directly. Mm. Our troops don't deploy without being, without receiving training on issues of human rights, on sexual exploitation and abuse, on the local culture understanding. And when they come, there is refresher training. That's, that's never enough. Mm -hmm. You have to have an officer corps that is very mindful, knowledgeable about that, and keep the work going as well. We just concluded a uh, high partnership uh, level forum uh, in, in, uh, in Mogadishu, with 32 delegations coming from all over. And the issue of governance has been debated over and over again. The issue of tackling corruption, discussing with uh, folks like the World Bank and IMF, EU and others, mm -hmm. to see how we give the Somali authorities this instrument to be more accountable when it comes to those issues. Mm -hmm. That is something to be, to be pursued. Now, you mentioned charcoal and maybe KDF involved, etc. As head of AMISOM, I haven't seen that. I need people to give me those was evidence. Right. Uh, I know the Somali Eritrea Mountain Group has mentioned that in the past as well. They have their job to do it, to look into it, and we work with them to find out more. Uh, the KDF I know is the KDF going after Al Shabaab right now, liberating Barderi and Dinsu, the Ethiopians, and over I mean, some colleagues and SNA. This is the KD, uh, KDF I know. The KDF I know is the folks I go and visit at Karen at training school. Uh, training. No, no, Karen Hospital. Oh, I, at, at the hospital. Uh, Aga Khan, at, uh, at many other hospitals. People injured in the line of duty. Who are, no longer have limbs. Right. This is the KDF, the Djibouti, the, the, the Burundi, the Ethiopia, the Ugandan troops I know. Mm. Those are close to me. Mm. Not anybody involved in charcoal. Al-Shabaab is involved in charcoal. We know that. Mm. At least they get taxes from whoever is working on charcoal. I think this has to be investigated a bit further and more uh, and deeper. Deeply. So we expose whoever is doing that, but we just don't throw out right. accusations right. on people who are busy doing something more noble. And in many ways, this uh, fuels an Al-Shabaab narrative uh, when you throw out of stories. Of, so let's come to that as, as a final focus. And, and an amazing quote I, I heard recently was uh, that the, the relationship, this uncomfortable relationship between media and, and, and um, terrorists needs to be ended. Um, somebody, a professor, referred to it as a strange bedfellows in, in a marriage of unfortunate marriage of convenience. Yeah. Um, let's just look at that for a moment and, and let me pose the question. Many people who are watching know Somalia as an unsafe area where mm. bombs go off. You've said to us at the beginning of this show, this is not necessarily the Somalia that exists. Why do you think there's a failure to cover the complete picture? And how can we encourage both local journalists in Somalia, African journalists as well, and the international community to ensure they're painting a fair picture? Julie, I was one time a journalist. <laughs> I did Perfect. Some, some, some time. Uh, in Niger? In Niger, yes. as head of national television also. I think sometimes we are lazy. Not only journalists, but also out there, the public. Mm. We don't go beyond the headlines. Right. A bomb has gone off at Al Jazeera Hotel. It's a big and huge event, of course. But what that has to do with the multifaceted dimension of Somalia's life? People working, farms being uh, plugged, 
uh, harvests. Diaspora the, returning. Diaspora returning and investing and mm. building hotels, the same hotels that these crazy mad dogs are destroying. Mm. So this is what we need to be working on more. I was earlier telling one of your colleagues, we have together to build the capacity also of Somali journalists. Mm -hmm. I in, very resourceful. I interact with them all the time. But you can see that there is work to be done there. The linkages between media houses and AMISOM and the Somali and the ground is not there. How many are visiting us? How many are going and see our troops? How many know exactly what Somalia are going for? How many, how many know how much banana is going from Somalia to, <laughs> to the Gulf? I mean, just, to, just right. to, to mention those things. So there is life and there is terror around asymmetric warfare around that. Why do we choose just to, uh, to privilege that, or, or that other side of it? What, why not the success stories also? Right. Is Somalia Iraq or Yemen or Libya? Many would think it is. Well, I'm sorry, um, 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 that's not what it is. That's not the Mogadishu I live in. Right. That's not what's happening in certain districts. Some districts are more difficult than others because culturally people tend not to say, oh, X is that Shabab, et cetera, et cetera. But we, even that is changing, as I mentioned to you, when, when the operation is going now and people are approaching our troops mm. and saying, please stay here. Please keep helping us. Mm. Please help our militia and our, our surveillance bodies get stronger and know more about how to fight. But the narrative you are mentioning is something we all have to work on to counter the other narrative of hatred and division. Right. Uh, and, and for that, we have to, to be less lazy. Maybe, maybe the powers that be in the international media give also over assignments to their, to their troops, because mm. they also have their own troops uh, reporting. Uh, I will stop it at that, because uh, uh, this is something we're thinking very deeply into. The other day, I was told but we need to look into issues of youth radical, radicalization or de-radicalization. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, add to that strategic communication. How do we counter this ability that Al-Shabaab has to populate the social media? Mm -hmm. And how come? And to own the narrative. It's one of How come the Americans intervene in Somalia? They're su supporting us now, the Europeans, the Chinese, all of us, all this big powers and the rest of us who master this medium. And yet, it's working better for Al-Shabaab. Mm. So it's a matter of priority. It's a matter of uh, really wanting to do, to do the right thing or focusing on writing, uh, doing the right thing. They call it the counter-narrative. In many ways, I say it's not a counter It's the complete picture. It's telling the absolute story, the good, the progress, the success, as well as, as the challenges. Challenge. We've come to the end already, and we always ask our guests to please look into the camera and deliver a personal message to Africa. You play, as an individual, a key role in, in progressing this continent. And the success of Amazon could be replicated in so many ways uh, in, in other parts of Africa that are unstable. But what message do you have? Or what challenge do you have for other Africans who are asking themselves, how can I play a role in, in building a progressive Africa? Please share. Thank you. First of all, I would say Africans from Uganda all the way to Djibouti who are contributing troops and police to Amisom in Somalia, the sacrifices of our boys and girls is not in vain. There is a Somalia that is coming up, that is believing in a renewal to be part of this region, fully part of this region, and contribute to its development and stability. Secondly, this is really the first African enterprise, I may say, that I see where Africans didn't wait for anybody to come and tell them do this for your region, do this for a sister country. They went in and they, then we sought the sort of support of partners in the world. We're doing this for generations to come because that's going to be the legacy, but particularly talking to our leaders because they also be watching. This is your best legacy to our children and future generations. So I'd say, yes, they contributed. Yes, they don't go to the dustbin of 
some of us who didn't perform or didn't or, or forgot about their people. And for the Somalis, I would say we are in this together. We'll continue in this together. We won't let an unfinished business behind. Because an unfinished business in your country would be Africa's failure. And we want all of that to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Merci. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Africa Leadership Dialogue, I am Ambassador Maman Sidiku, Special Representative of a Chairperson of African Union Commission and Head of AMISOM. Really interesting insights there on the growth and development of Somalia. I wonder, does it change your view of the country? Time now for your views on the issues. This week we asked you, how can Africa deal with the scourge of terrorism? Martin Juguna says, it is prudent that the already installed counter-terrorism mechanisms of the police and the military are upgraded in such a way that better coordination among African countries in sharing of operational information is efficient. Increasing the number of soldiers in the country, okay, this is a bit of a radical idea, but think about it. If children are trained to be soldiers before they are actually citizens, then everybody will have an equal chance to beat the terrorists should an attack happen because everyone is a soldier in their own right. And that way we won't have to depend to depend on the Kenya forces so much. And we'll actually be able to, you know, have a chance to beat them and defend our country. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. And on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus two five four 715-816-033 And now we go to Africa's Top 10. This week on Africa's Top 10, we feature countries most affected by the business cost of terrorism. The objective of the research was to determine the extent in which businesses in these African countries are affected by terrorism. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Burkina Faso with an index of 3.9 and is ranked 128 globally. Coming in at number 9 is Algeria. The North African country is ranked 129 globally with an index of 3.8. Positioned at number 8 is Uganda. The landlocked East African country attained an index of 3.6 and is ranked 131 globally. Taking the number 7 spot is Tunisia with an index of 3.3 and ranked 133 globally. At number 6 is Chad. The Central African state attained an index of 3.2 and is ranked 134 globally. Kenya takes the number 5 spot with an index of 3.0 and is ranked 135 globally. Slotted in at number 4 is Nigeria. The oil-rich West African country is ranked 137 globally with an index of 2.8. Anchored in at number 3 is Mali. Being one of the largest producers of gold in Africa, Mali is ranked 141 globally with an index of 2.5. Coming in at number 2 is Libya. With one of the largest proven oil reserves, Libya attained an index of 2.45 and is ranked 142 globally. And at number 1 this week is Egypt with an index of 2.4 and is ranked 143 globally. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. We close with words of wisdom as always, and this week our proverb goes, if you can't resolve your problems in peace, you cannot solve war. It's that simple. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.